This spotlight brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. Good evening and welcome to the spotlight. I'm David Rose. After a steep increase in violent crimes in recent years, Tacoma is making significant progress towards becoming a safer city. At least that's the message from the police chief and researchers who presented a year's worth of results from their crime reduction plan. Our team coverage begins with the spotlights, Frankie Thompson. Crime is still significantly higher than pre pandemic levels here in Tacoma, but the police chief says the decision to stick with his plan has resulted in double digit differences in public safety. In one year of the Tacoma Police Department implementing a crime reduction plan, the city saw a 17.5% reduction in violent crimes. But rest assured that we, the Tacoma Police Department, are working and are committed to reducing crime in this city. Chief Avery Moore and a team of researchers from the University of Texas San Antonio created this plan after rampant violence hit record levels in Tacoma. The trend has been reversed. The latest data from that plan is from July 2022 to June 2023. During that time, one area of enforcement was officers conducting hotspot treatments at known locations where crime was highest, and officials say those patrols paid off big time. Violent crime is down 20, about 26%. Um, across all of our treatment locations. During that same one year period of the plan, Tacoma saw a 26.7 reduction in murders. We all recognize that while the numbers are good, we, we've had a rough week and uh, a rough couple of weeks and that one homicide is too many in the city of Tacoma. In October and so far in November this year, there have been seven shootings across the city. Only one of them was not deadly. The last couple of weeks, haven't been very good. Just Sunday, five people were shot inside a business. Two people lost their lives. Chief Moore says the promising news is that suspect and other offenders in Tacoma are getting arrested. Citywide drug arrest are up. Citywide weapon arrest are up. And the point I'm making is we're making a lot of arrest, a lot of great arrest. Um, we're just doing it not necessarily associated to the crime plan, but really is in that we've made significant arrests with racing and speeding. Many of them have weapons, drugs, et cetera. Um, we've done several drug related arrests with FBI, DEA, et cetera. Phase one of the crime reduction plan is complete. Officials say though data shows violent crime is going down, it still remains substantially higher than it was before the COVID-19 pandemic. There's still a lot of work to left to be done um, with reducing violent crime in Tacoma. Um, the good news is that the trend is moving in the right direction now. Chief Morris says the department just started phase two of the violent crime reduction plan. This includes a deeper focus on Hosmer Street. There is already an operations plan developed to address crime on that historically challenged street. Hosmer Street in Tacoma has long been home to shootings, drugs and murder, with a few block stretch accounting for hundreds of cases of violence and lawbreaking. One abandoned hotel in particular stood out as the epicenter of all that was going wrong on Hosmer. But now the spotlights AJ Janabel tells us how that former crime den has found a new life as a space for families to call home. Not too long ago, there was nothing safe about this complex. And then when we realized that we were dealing with like cartel level narcotics and drugs and all of that, that was when I thought, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Emily Hubbard is co-owner of Sage Investment Group. Her company bought this dilapidated and dangerous property with the intention of turning it into homes for dozens. But she almost gave up on that dream. Yeah, there was a drive by shooting directed at our crew because they didn't want the building to be anything other than what it was. Instead, she and her company doubled down, working to clear out the crime. Looking at it is just like this massive labor of love of like what it took for us to get here. Looking at before and after pictures, you can get a small idea of what went into this change. When we bought it, um, it's not what it looked like, it was what it smelled like, AJ. After months of doubt, fear, and hard work, Friday, the complex began accepting applications for people looking to call this revitalized space home. Safe Harbor offers more than 100 studio apartments with amenities and utilities included for $1,500 total. And Hubbard tells me they're not stopping with just one complex along Hosmer Street. So between now and next August, we're hoping to bring on 600 units plus. Despite not even being open, Hubbard says Safe Harbor has already become a site of community, recently hosting a Halloween event 
for hundreds of kids. She tells me her plan is to continue to grow that feeling. At a certain point, it became less about our investment and more about just helping the area and being able to do what we said we were gonna do regardless of so many people that were convinced that we were gonna fail. The mother of a young man who went missing almost five years ago says she still has more questions than answers after his partial remains were found in Thurston County. 20 year old Matthew Anfelt was last seen on February 28th, 2019. The Thurston County Sheriff's Office says a hunter recently found his partial remains. They were discovered in the Grand Mound, Rochester area. Hearing the news, Matthew's mom caught the next flight to Seattle, but she tells the spotlight she still does not have closure. Change. We just need a change. Before he disappeared in 2019, Matthew Anfeld had never gone more than 24 hours without contacting his mom. After he vanished, his music and videos helped keep her going. And then my mama told me to stand up on my feet and do what I got and all my blessings. As the years progressed, Sarah moved to Florida, but never gave up hope that her son would be found. Last Thursday, her phone rang. It was a Thurston County Sheriff's detective. A hunter found Matthew's partial remains. And it felt like five years, almost five years of emotion. Every emotion that I felt the last five years just sort of running through me at one time. Um, I couldn't really cry. I couldn't really. I just remember my body just starting to shake. Then came the questions. So many questions. There's no way that he just went off into a remote area and laid down and died. On the day he disappeared, Matthew was his usual self, wearing a Chicago Bulls sweatshirt. He went bowling with his sister, then home to Tonino before 4.30 p.m. They were planning to watch movies. He left her room to get his phone, but never returned. From that point, we know that he went to the neighbors um, yelling about his family and crying. He then ran out onto the roadway, stopping traffic, saying that his family had been murdered. Witnesses who called 911 said it appeared Matthew was in crisis. A short time later, he showed up two miles away at the Speedway Grocery on Old Highway 99 South in Grand Mound. He was barefoot, scared, and had blood around his mouth. He left his phone at home, and he wasn't dressed for the winter weather. None of it makes sense to me. Um, everything that happened that day doesn't make sense. Searchers focused on this area in the circle, but found nothing. Then, on October 28th, his remains were finally discovered on the other side of I-5 in an area that had not been searched. How did he end up over there? You know, how did no one see him when all these 911 calls were coming in between our house and the store and then suddenly nothing? Sarah doesn't know yet how he died. Was he kidnapped and killed? Detectives say he was the victim of a crime 10 weeks before he disappeared. He was jumped by someone and had signs of physical injuries. He had mentioned right before he went missing to a couple of his friends that some people were after him, but we haven't been able to develop who those people were. At this point, you don't know if it's foul play or if it's accidental. I don't know. I have been told over and over, despite how much information we have, we need a body, we need a body. So um, now we have that opportunity. She's hoping more searches turn up the evidence detectives need to determine once and for all what happened to Matthew. I want to be able to lay him to rest. I want to be able to have him home with us. Uh, and if that's all I get, then that's, I'll take that. But I do, if somebody did something, I do want them to pay that ultimate consequence. Sarah is grateful to everyone who has shown her support. A GoFundMe has been started to help pay for travel, funeral expenses, and her loss of income. We'll post a link in our story on fox13seattle.com. And if you have any information on Matthew's case, now is the time to come forward. Please contact the Thurston County Sheriff's Office. New video is giving us a clearer look at a road rage shooter's car. The King County Sheriff's Office is looking for this 2009 to 2011 Hyundai sedan. Detectives say the driver tried to kill a young woman near Kent. Deputies say the suspect was driving aggressively on 272nd Street in Kent on the morning of Monday, October 23rd. That driver shot at the victim from behind before pulling up next to her and firing again. Those bullets hit her arm and left her in bad shape. She ended up crashing into the front of a pumpkin patch. Her family says she's gone through four surgeries and will have to have more operations before she recovers. The shooter was just behind her. She was just trying to get out of their way. And he yelled at her to not do that again. And she doesn't understand what she was doing. 
and that's all she remembers was just being shot at. She worries the next victim won't be so lucky. Here's another look at the suspect's car. It's a black Hyundai sedan with dark tinted windows with a model year between 2009 and 2011. If you know where this car is or who drives it, call 911 or submit an anonymous tip to Crime Stoppers by calling 1-800-222-TIPS. You will remain anonymous. Another sacred place of worship is no longer feeling safe to some people in our community. Police have responded to several different synagogues for possible hazardous substances. Alejandro Guzman spoke to the person who made one of the alarming discoveries and called 911. Is that what happened on October 7th? Everybody knows somebody who was killed or who was kidnapped or who's one of the hostages or who's fighting right now. The war in Israel is being fought thousands of miles away from Seattle, Washington, but those tensions are still being felt by the local Jewish community. Nobody's doing well right now. Ari Hoffman, president of the BCMH synagogue, says there's a level of uncertainty after Friday services were interrupted. A suspicious package was found at a South Seattle congregation. One of the office guys was wrapping up his day, saw this letter, opened it, and this white powdery substance came out. The person called 911 immediately. Hazmat crews quickly showed up. We all started contacting each other, check your mail, check your mail, check your mail, because it looked very unassuming. And then we found out four different organizations got these things. There may be a fifth, there may even be a sixth that we're looking into right now. Local officials confirmed the substance was not hazardous, but the Jewish community is on edge. Hoffman says he saw the documents that were in that package. I saw them. They were crazy fundamentalist writing. Is, is this something where somebody did this as a prank or is this something where somebody got the recipe wrong? A valid question as the Anti-Defamation League of the Pacific Northwest says the last three weeks have been especially taxing for the Jewish community. There's a mix of grief and fear and uncertainty. The ADL is one of the first to be called when acts of hate or bias occur. Associate Regional Director Stephen Paolini says they've seen a 388% increase in anti-Semitic incidents of vandalism, harassment and assault nationwide, a trend that holds true in Washington. He says the ADL is aware of at least two packages delivered at two Jewish institutions. Security for one of the synagogues shared these images saying a third delivery was made Saturday. The ADL has been closely working with the FBI. It doesn't appear with the evidence we have right now that it was motivated by anti-Semitism. It seems like there were other issues at play, but the impact to the community is nonetheless severe. One of the largest encampments in unincorporated King County will have more time to find somewhere else to go. There are a lot of people living in vehicles and RVs along Green River near a popular soccer field near Kent. That field is where thousands of kids play sports. Recently, Valor Soccer said they had to close down their season early because of rampant crime, much of it associated with the homeless encampment. Crews have been cleaning up the work at the encampment, including installing fencing and no parking signs. Everyone was told they had to go, and they were moved to a temporary lot in Georgetown. Now they'll have a little more time to leave. County officials say outreach services are available for those who've been forced to get out. But tell Fox 13, resources in South King County are limited with no safe parking lots and most shelters at capacity. A military doctor who works at JBLM accused of sexually assaulting dozens of patients. He was meant to be in a military courtroom, but instead he's waived his appearance, opening up the chance that a commander could make the call on whether he'll face a court martial. As Matthew Smith reports, this case comes as the military is attempting to overhaul its entire justice system. There's a huge stigma in the military about reporting sexual assault. People don't come forward because the chances of justice are very slim. Josh Connolly is the VP of Protect Our Defenders. For years, he worked up on Capitol Hill, and during that time, he grew a passion for helping survivors of sexual violence in the military. His group scored a big win this year, President Biden signing off on the biggest change to the military justice system in decades, putting charging decisions for 11 major offenses, including sex assault, rape, and domestic violence, into the hands of independent prosecutors rather than victim superiors, which could make them targets for retaliation. The assailant was often someone in the survivor's chain of command, the same chain of command responsible for deciding the case. Making sure the commanders aren't making legal decisions has been a big, a big effort of ours. Um, and making the justice system look a lot more like the civilian system. Of course, the change hasn't happened overnight. 
Behind these Madigan gates at JBLM lies the hospital where dozens of men have stepped up and faced that traditional chain of command while accusing Major Michael Stockin of sexually assaulting them during his time in the military. When asked this week whether victims were being sought at other military installations Stockin worked at, I was told the Army does not comment on ongoing investigations. It's a concern for lawyers representing many of these victims. I am deeply worried that there are survivors out there, that there are men who sacrifice and, and put themselves and their families at risk to protect our country, and we're not taking the necessary steps to protect them. And yet, even when changes take root, there's an even larger concern. The military as a whole is protected from lawsuits thanks to something called the Ferris Doctrine. Essentially, it stops people from suing the military. If we were able to sue the military for um, negligence in regards to uh, sexual assault and harassment, um, and, and they were having to pay billions of dollars, um, like any institution or company would if they maintained a similar climate, I think that would really increase their vigilance in regards to harassment and assault. Protect Our Defenders estimates there are 25 to 30,000 sexual assaults in the military a year. Men, women, teens. A fraction of those, a few hundred lead to conviction. As for our local case unfolding, experts tell Fox 13 they expect Major Stockin to face a court martial in the coming weeks. His case now being compared to Larry Nasser in terms of how this was a person of position of power as a doctor and the sheer number of victims. As for Stockin, Fox 13 has been in contact with his lawyer. We do expect to hear more from him as the case unfolds. Kids are sneaking guns into Puyallup schools. Pierce County Sheriff's deputies say they arrested a teenager armed with a firearm at Emerald Ridge High School. Investigators tell us that student tried to hide the gun from staff by passing it off to a friend. Now the scariest part is this is the fourth time this has happened in Puyallup in a month. Pierce County Sheriff's deputies say a 15 year old boy armed with a handgun walked the halls of Emerald Ridge High School in Puyallup for hours on Wednesday until he got caught smoking weed in the bathroom around one in the afternoon. The principal went over and intercepted that bag, opened it and immediately was in disbelief. The SR went over, looked in the bag and there was a firearm inside this kid's backpack. Investigators say they arrested the student and Puyallup school district officials tell me the 15 year old is expelled. But this kind of trouble is not new to the district this year. Yeah, just a month ago, we had two other incidents in the Puyallup School District, one at Glacier View Junior High, right next to Emerald Ridge, and the other one at Ballou Junior High, uh, just a few miles from this high school as well. And last Thursday, Puyallup police say they arrested a teenage boy for bringing a gun into Puyallup High School. No one was hurt in any of these incidents. I asked Sergeant Darren Moss, with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, why kids are bringing guns into schools. Well, I would love to tell you, but unfortunately, we're not allowed to interview any juveniles without an attorney present. So we can never ask them why they thought they needed to bring a gun. What was the point? Were they trying to hurt somebody? Were they protecting themselves? Hands up! Put your hands up! Moss does tell me they believe the rise in teenage violence on the streets is starting to spill into the classrooms. But if you look at all of our armed robberies, our burglaries where they're smashing vehicles into businesses, uh, our shootings and even some of our homicides, the victims and suspects are teenagers and young adults. He says the best way to prevent guns in schools is to lock up your firearms. Officials with the Puyallup School District tell Fox 13 News they're alarmed by the number of incidents. They're hosting a community safety forum to answer questions and concerns. It's being held next Tuesday. Showing kids a one minute video featuring a police officer discussing gun safety could help reduce the chances a child picks up and misuses a gun if they come across one. That's according to new research. The Spotlight's Brian Jackson takes a closer look at the findings that could save lives. The results of a recent study could help prevent accidental child firearm deaths and injuries. The experiment from The Ohio State University involved more than 200 kids ages 8 to 12. Pairs of kids were placed in a playroom staged with various toys in a file cabinet containing two plastic handguns that looked very real. Over time, curiosity led many of the kids to open the cabinet and find the guns. What happened next varied based on several factors. A week prior to the study, half the kids were shown a one-minute gun safety video recorded by a police officer. The other half watched an officer explain car safety. Children who had seen the gun safety video were much more likely to tell an adult 
were much less likely to touch it. If they did touch it, they held it for less time. Uh, if they held it at all, they were less likely to pull the trigger. Researchers believe the gun safety video was especially effective because the message was delivered by an authority figure. Meanwhile, the study exposed other risk factors researchers say influence kids to pick up and play with the guns. Boys were more likely to behave recklessly with the guns than the girls were. Uh, we also found that uh, if kids were watching more age-inappropriate media, such as PG-13 or R-rated movies, they were also more likely to behave recklessly with the guns. Well, that's all the time we have this week for this edition of The Spotlight. Until next week, be smart and stay safe.